Our next speaker for the evening, Professor Bernard Schubel, specializes in the history of religions, particularly Islam and Hinduism. He has extensive field experience, which includes his work as a Fulbright Scholar in Pakistan, and a year-long sabbatical in which he conducted research in Uzbekistan on Islamic narratives in post-Soviet Central Asia. He is the author of the book, Right Religious Performance in Contemporary Islam. His most recent research has been on the Alizic community in Turkey. He is currently the chair of the religious Department of Religious Studies at Kenyon College. So I would now like to invite Professor Bernard to give us a little lecture on the Prophet Muhammad as a role model community. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to come and speak in honor of the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. And I think it's serendipitous that my talk is following that very interesting video because the title of my talk is Loving Muhammad. I've been studying the religion of Islam for more than 30 years and I've conducted research in Pakistan, in Uzbekistan, and Turkey. And if I've learned anything about Islam, it's the importance of love for the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic piety. Now, that may sound obvious, and it should sound obvious, but it isn't always, especially for non-Muslims. As I tell my students at the beginning of my Islam course, quoting the late Professor Karar Hussain, Islam is about a man and a book. It recognizes that both the Quran and the Prophet are essential for Muslims. Now, there are some, both inside and outside the Quran, who sometimes misinterpret the love for Muhammad that is manifested throughout the religious culture of Islam as a form of shirk. While it is true for Muslims that the Prophet is just a human being, as the renowned scholar of Islam, Vincent Cornell, has pointed out, to say that the Prophet is just another human being is like saying a ruby is just a stone. <laughs> Others identify Islam primarily with the Quran and downplay the Prophet, emphasizing that he is to be understood primarily as the revealer of the Quran, and thus exclude his importance as a focus of love and devotion. For them, the book is sufficient. Despite the reality that most Muslims have agreed with Imam Shafi that the very existence of the Quran assumes the Prophet as its interpreter. For them, Islam is identical with the Quran, but we shouldn't forget that there are two shahadas that most of us say, and that one is a shahada wa la ilaha illallah, and the second and equally important is a shahada wa Muhammad Rasulullah. We should always remember that in the earliest days of Islam, when the Quran was not yet complete and only a handful of verses, one became a Muslim by giving bayat, allegiance to the Prophet Muhammad. It was the charismatic authority of the Prophet that was rooted in his honesty, his humility, his forbearance, the beauty of his soul that was one of the major reasons that Islam grew, first in Mecca and later in Medina, and clearly, and later around the world. Clearly, Muhammad was a man who was loved. And in fact, as I was sitting here, in many ways to be a Muslim is to be an ashik of the Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> The importance of love for Muhammad is sometimes missed because the focus of Muhammad in Islam is often presented in terms of the role of the Sunnah as part of a Sul al fiqh as a source of Islamic law. In that context, because fiqh is a rational process, the Prophet's life is cut into bits and pieces and arranged by category. This is how he dressed, this is how he did business, this is what he did in these circumstances and others. But in so doing, we risk losing the drama, the poignancy. The humanity of the Prophet is revealed in narrative, a story. Because the most human thing that we do as human beings is we tell stories. We are the only creatures that God has made to tell stories. In the Sunnah, the Prophet becomes a book. But the Prophet Muhammad was not a book. He was a man. And his biography reveals his deep humanity, his insaniyat. And insaniyat is at the heart of the Quran and of Islam. The Prophet's humanity is a critical source of akhlaq, or ethics and virtue, and adab. And in our daily lives as Muslims, akhlaq and adab are every bit as important as fit. It is here that Muslims seek to ask, when confronted with the problems of modern life, what would Muhammad do? And how would I best follow him to the best of my ability? 
Surely love for Muhammad is one of the elements that links Muslims across madhab and across culture. It is love for Muhammad that links the majority of Muslims. It is at the heart of the Sufi tradition. It is at the heart of the Sunni tradition. And it is, of course, the central element of the Shi'i tradition. When I began to seriously study Islam, one of my teachers said, if you want to understand Islam, learn about Muhammad and his life. And I didn't think I really understood that, because I ran home and read Maxim Radisson's biography of the Prophet, and it didn't do anything for me. But then I went to Pakistan in the 1980s, and I really began to understand the issue, because I began to understand how Muslims understood the Prophet. All this talk about Muhammad as a general, people that I meet in the Muslim world don't think about Muhammad as a general. They think about him as a man of poverty and humility and compassion. When I arrived in Karachi and mentioned to someone that I was studying Shia Islam, someone pulled me, this person pulled me aside and said, you have to understand something about Shiism. And it's really something about Islam in general. Islam is about love for God. And if you want to love God, how do you show that love? by loving those whom God loved. And who did God love most? Well, we heard it. Who is the Habibi? Who is Habibullah? It is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so if you want to love God, you should love his prophet. And then the Shia go a step further and they say, if you want to love the prophet Muhammad, who should you love? His Ahl Bayt, because he loved them. And so one shows love for God by loving humanity. This is crucial because I've met people who don't understand that Shi'i Muslims love the Prophet and not just the al Bayt. I've heard people say things that are not true, like Shias don't name their sons Muhammad because they only name them Ali because they don't love Muhammad. I tell you what we all know in this room. Nothing could be further from the truth. Love for Muhammad is shared both by Sunni and Shia. He is Muhammad Habibullah. This is clearly seen in the wonderful story of the cloak where Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein gather together for warmth under the cloak of Muhammad and even Jibreel sees that light gathered together from the highest <laughs> Among the Alevis of Anatolia, who are sometimes also misunderstood in their beliefs, they uh, tell, they understand Muhammad, Ali, and God, who they frequently refer to as Dos, the friend, not as a trinity in the Christian sense, but as three persons interconnected in a mysterious relationship of love and friendship. There's a wonderful medieval Turkish story to this extent. I don't know if it's true, but it's a wonderful revayat. When Ali was born in the Kaaba, he pulled the blanket over his face, and when the, uh, the, the, uh, the midwife tried to pull it down, he slapped her. He tried to pull it down again. He slapped her. She ran to get Muhammad and said, I don't know what's wrong. This, 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 this young boy, he, he, won't, he won't show his face. When the prophet came in, Ali pulled the blanket down because Ali wanted the first thing that he saw in this world to be the face of the beloved prophet Muhammad. <laughs> she Muslims love the prophet Muhammad. This is at the heart of the story of Khadir where the Prophet says, I am his mala, and he is my mala, because each is the master and the servant of the other. Similarly, love for the Prophet is at the center of the Sufi tradition. The basis of the tariqah is love for one's peer, to whom we, one gives bayat and allegiance as the companions wow. gave bayat to the Prophet Muhammad. The adab one sees in a Sufi hanka is based on the adab of the Prophet and his family and his companions. And it is through love, which is the spiritual engine of the Sufi path, that one becomes annihilated in the peer, who was annihilated in his peer, who was annihilated in his peer, who was ultimately annihilated in the Prophet. And the Prophet was annihilated in God, and thus one follows the path back through Muhammad to God. Sufi poetry, the lyrics of Kabbali, are drenched in the love of the Prophet. Rumi was once asked by Shah Shams, he said, leader of the Muslims, was Bayezid greater than the Prophet? Some of you know who Bayezid Bistami was. He said, in a, in a moment of ecstasy, he said, behold, there is no one under, under my cloak who is greater than me, as if he was saying that he was God. That's controversial, but Rumi replied, the Prophet is the greatest of all human beings. Why do you talk about Bayezid? Shams then asked, then how can the Prophet have said, we have not known thee as thou ought to be known, 
while Bayezid said, Glory be to me, how great I am. And Rumi said, Bayezid's thirst was slaked with one gulp. He spoke of being full, and the jug of his comprehension was filled. But his illumination was only as much as came through the skylight of his house. The prophet, on the other hand, sought to be given much to drink, and thirsted after thirst. He spoke of thirst and was ever beseeching to be drawn closer. If you read the Masnavi, love for the prophet is on almost every page, because the prophet was the only one of all God's creatures who came within two boats lengths of the throne of God. It's said that it's written on our bodies. 81, an Arabic script, 18. We subtract 18 from 81, 63. <coughs> the number of years that the prophet lived on this earth. In Central Asia, at the tomb of Ahmed Yasavi, Ahmed Yasavi reached 63 years of age and moved underground and never again walked on the face of the earth because out of love for the prophet, he believed it unseemly to walk the earth longer than the prophet. This kind of love for the prophet <coughs> penetrates deep into Muslim culture. This importance of love for, oh, sorry, I was on the wrong page. <laughs> I get nervous. I'm sorry about that. The prophet's poverty is the source of all later fakir like in Dervisha. His patched cloak is the source of the khirka, which is the symbol of the authority of Sufi sheikhs. His states and stations. Sabr, Rida, Fakr, Tabakko. These are the ones that are reflected on the Sufi path. These are the words we teach our children are about what it is to be a good person. Have Sabr. Why? Because the Prophet had Sabr. Clearly Muhammad is special for Muslims, and Muhammad's life is a focus of veneration and a model to follow. He is for Muslims El Insan El Kamal. Notice I say, and the Muslims say, insan al-kamal, and not just musulman al-kamal. Because as I've written elsewhere, what is central to Islam is the notion of humanity. And there are certain universal human values that are part of what it is to be truly human in every culture that I know of. <coughs> Honesty, generosity, tolerance, compassion, courage, forgiveness. These are not Christian values. They're certainly not only Western values coming from the Enlightenment. They're not even only Muslim values. Part of the reason that Muhammad could reach out and touch the Arabs of Mecca and Medina and what was that he manifest virtues that were already understandable to the best of Arab culture. He was Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Beyond this, the spread of Islam beyond Arabia was in no small part because the virtues of the, of the Prophet were also intelligible to the Hindus and Buddhists and Zoroastrians of South and Central Asia, who saw in the prophet the best of what they thought humanity should be as well. This is the position put forward by the modern Muslim writer Tariq Ramadan in a remarkable new book on the life of Muhammad called In the Footsteps of the Prophet. It's a shame that Tariq Ramadan can't come here to speak, but the US won't give him a visa for reasons that I can't tell. <laughs> Ramadan, writing for both a Muslim and a non-Muslim audience, decided that the best way to communicate Islam in the modern world was to tell the Prophet's story, as a story, as a narrative. He says, and I quote, Our attention is mainly focused on the story of his life, on situations, attitudes, or words that could reveal Muhammad's personality and what it can teach and convey to us today. But he is trying to tell this story not only to get his audience to intellectually appreciate the problem. He wants his readers to understand and experience something of the love that he and other Muslims feel for Muhammad. As he puts it, and this is a lengthy quote, but I think it's a very valuable one, our aim is to get to know the prophet himself more than to learn about Excuse me, our aim is more to get to know the prophet himself and to learn about his personality or the events of his life. What is sought are immersion, sympathy, and essentially love. Whether one believes or not, it is not impossible to try to immerse oneself in the prophet's quest and existence and recapture the pulse, the spirit that infused his mission with meaning. This is indeed the primary ambition of this work, making of the messenger's life a mirror through which readers Facing the challenges of our time can explore their hearts and minds and achieve an understanding of questions of being and meaning as well as broader ethical and social concerns. 
He goes on to note the importance of love for the Prophet in Muslim hearts and memories and says, the Prophet's life is an invitation to a spirituality that avoids no questions and teaches us in the course of events, trials, hardships, and our quest that the true answers to existential questions are more often given by the heart than by the intelligence. Deeply simply, he who cannot love cannot understand. Tariq Ramadan then goes on to lovingly describe the Prophet. He shows the Prophet as a compassionate leader, a fountain of forgiveness, a man committed to justice and yet never arrogant in that quest for justice, a person of deep humility who identified with the lowest of humanity, with orphans, the poor, with slaves. He emphasized an egalitarian view of humanity, embracing all of Ammas. The Prophet listened to women. The Prophet loved children. Ramadan concludes his book with these words by saying, he was beloved by God and an example among humans. He loved, he gave, he served, he transformed. The Prophet was the light that leads to light, and in learning from his life, believers return to the source of life and find his light his warmth, his love. Recognize Muhammad as the messenger is essentially learning to love him in his absence and to love him in his presence. Loving and learning to love God, the prophet, the creation, and humankind. I find that to be a remarkable statement about the prophet and about God. Stephen, Stephanie Geary, in her New York Times review of the book, says this. Ramadan's Muhammad is a kind man. We could be a little informal, bro. I was going to talk very little. <laughs> Ramadan's Muhammad, said Ms. Geary, is a kind man and a wise leader. He is fair to his wives. He is openly affectionate with his daughters. He is generally good to women. He lets them into mosques. Gentleness is one of Ramadan's favorite words. Muhammad knows when to encourage patience and faith in his followers and when to indulge their craving for rest. He consults before making decisions and wages war only when necessary. He is tolerant of non-Muslims and fair to his enemies. His faith is unflappable, but he is also a critical thinker. He uses reason to translate the word of God into practical ethics. If Muhammad is the embodiment of Islam, Islam is a religion of moderation, common sense, resilience, and love." Unquote. <laughs> Geary, having been moved by the book in this way, her Islamophobia, or I don't want to accuse her of that, but she's nervous about being drawn to the Prophet. She reads this and goes, oh, the Prophet sounds like he's really special. Islam sounds like a good thing. But then she says, some will challenge Ramadan's understated, if not euphemistic, treatment of the Muslim conquest of the Arabian Peninsula and his claim that armed jihad is justified only in self-defense. But judging this avowedly interpretive biography by its historical accuracy or quality of its Quranic interpretation is to miss the more relevant question. What does this book reveal about Ramadan's political philosophy? She, she doubts that Ramadan's telling the truth. That this is actually the prophet that is either in the classical sources, although she could look it up herself, she could read Ibn Ishaq, she could read Tabari, it's translated into English, or that this is what Muslims believe. In the context of the book, Ramadan's political philosophy, and this is one of the things I think is most important about his book, is the notion that the Prophet Muhammad is not only an example to Islam, but also an example to humanity. As Geary summarizes Ramadan's perspective, Islam does not establish a closed <coughs> universe of reference. Rather, it relies on a set of universal principles that can coincide with the fundamentals and values of other beliefs and religious traditions. Geary argues that she cannot enter or settle the argument that Muhammad is in fact the kind of person that Muhammad portrays him as. Instead, she argues, Muhammad may not have been as sober and sensible as Ramadan writes, but why take issue with the portrayal if it can help reconcile Islam with Western liberalism today? The project that Ramadan states in his own is worth pursuing, even if for some Ramadan himself cannot be trusted with it. But here, I have to take issue with Giri. Who is Muhammad? All I can say is that when I have traveled, the prophet that I have met reflected in the heart of Muslims is described by his generosity, his poverty, and his sacrifice. This is the prophet as he is described in the major classical sources. 
We can always question the accuracy of sources. That's what scholars do. But the Muhammad of the classical sources is, without doubt, a Muhammad of humaneness, civility, and compassion. When I teach the life of the Prophet to my largely non-Muslim student body, <coughs> if any of you have sons or daughters and want to come to a liberal arts college, I'd be happy to have you come to my classes. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> Thank you. They identify with him. They are moved by his forbearance. They are moved by his forgiveness. This is a man who even forgave Abu Sufyan and him. And particularly, they recognize this distinction between the Prophet on the one hand at Medina and the Monophics who live there on the other. Because it is a universal human value to reject and despise hypocrisy. We find that in Hindu folklore, we find it in Buddhist stories, we find it in Jain stories, we find it in Christian stories. Medina was full of hypocrites. We all know who the Monophic are. They are those whose faces say one thing but words say another. These are our politicians. In every instance, <laughs> the prophet had but one face. And I'll say that again because I've really begun to learn this about the prophet, is that one of the things that's remarkable as I look back at the life of the prophet is that he only had one face. There was no duplicity in him. He truly was who he truly was. Ibn Ubay, at one point, having claimed to be a Muslim, went so far as to try to strangle the prophet, grabbing him by the cloak and shaking him. Interestingly, the prophet did not call him a kafir and did not cast him out of the ummah. The prophet had patience. He had sabr. The prophet was never a hypocrite. He had only one face. He was who he was. He was Insan al kamal His story resonates with my students who are mainly non-Muslim, because it is a story that resonates with universal human values. Those universal human values that the Quran implies were put into us when God put his rule into Adam at the moment of creation. We are not only Muslims, we are also human beings. These values of the Prophet resonate beyond the Ummah itself. In the end, we see him reflected. Oh, sorry. No, I broke it. Okay. In the end, we see him reflected in the best of his disciples. Mala Ali, Fatima, to whom he taught the zikr of remembrance. Rumi, who is so often translated in the West in ways that remove the love of the Prophet and Ali that is at the center of his worldview and who saw the Prophet as the best of humanity. One of my favorite stories of the Prophet is one that Ramadan also spends a lot of time on in his book. It's the incident at Hudabiyah, where the Prophet and his companions are prevented from making the pilgrimage, and instead he makes a treaty with the Quraysh that will allow him to return the next year. From the standpoint of his disciples, Ramadan argues, he was humiliated. They refused to let him sign his name as Rasulullah, instead demanded that he sign his name as Ibn Abdullah. But the Prophet, rather than fighting, knew when to negotiate. I think this is important because we have a presidential election happening and everyone's arguing about the commander-in-chief test. As if you judge a leader by what a great warrior he is. We're not trying to elect a negotiator-in-chief. We're trying to elect somebody who can prove that he can fight. The prophet knew when not to fight. The prophet was not just a general. Having first sought the obedience of his companions for whatever he might do, and Ramadan says, they probably thought when he did that, he says, we're going to fight and we'll likely die. Instead, he was asking them to lower themselves. And, Ramadan, and so he negotiated. We can speak of the Prophet as a warrior, but I am drawn to what Ibn Ishaq says of the Treaty of Hudabiyah. It's one of the most powerful things in that biography of the Prophet. Let me read it to you. No previous victory in Islam was greater than this. There was nothing but battle when men met. But when there was an armistice and war was abolished and men met in safety and consulted together, none talked about Islam intelligently without entering it. In those two years, double as many entered Islam as before. It was because of Hudabiyya that when the Battle of Mecca happened, there was almost no bloodshed. Because the Prophet knew that negotiation was better than battle. Even if it meant him lowering himself before people, that he was better than. Salu ala Muhammad.
For those who view the world as divided into Dar al Haq and Dar al Islam, I would point them to this. When the option was there, the Prophet chose peace. He bowed to conquer. He is thus a model not only for Muslims, but for all of humanity, particularly at this point in time when warfare can lead to annihilation of thousands or millions of people. I submit that the Prophet has things to teach all of humanity, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. And we as Muslims should begin to find ways that this story is told more effectively, both inside and outside the confines of the Ummah. As some of uh, my friends say, peace out. <laughs>